because she's such an inspiration to our museum. She's the granddaughter of C.A. Seward, who was really the force behind Wichita's Prairie Printmakers, a group that found an artist collective um, that founded here in 1930. She's a wonderful print historian, great writer. She's an insatiable as well as discerning print collector. And she's been one of the very best partners the Wichita Art Museum has ever had. We just love working with her on print um, exhibitions and admire the generosity um, she extends to Art Museum to support the activity. So with the Gearhart exhibition already well underway, Barbara approached us with the idea to have a complimentary show of other prairie printmakers to really show off um, the technique and the media of woodblock prints. So uh, very quickly, in just a handful of months, uh, Barbara pulled together, again, as our uh, good curator, a guest curator, um, the uh, Telling a Story exhibition. All will need to come and see it. But we're featuring and focusing on Francis Gearhart this evening. And that was a project that was several years um, in the works. And so we're fortunate to have Roger Genzer with us this evening, one of the leading experts on this artist. Um, Gearhart may not be that well known to many in the audience. Um, she lived her adult life in Southern California um, from 1869 um, to 1959. She first taught school, but when her college, when her college education was ended, and that was in 1889, she taught school. She was only able to devote herself full time um, to art making in 1923. Really significant printmaker, which when you come to see the exhibition here, you absolutely will see firsthand. She's one of the, uh, she's noted as one of the best color woodblock printmakers um, in the 20th century. And she joined the membership of Wichita's uh, Prairie Printmakers. This show, uh, worked on by Roger, is devoted to her exhibition history here in Wichita. So Roger, he has an academic training in photography and ceramics, native of California, raised in Los Angeles, been living in Santa Monica for years and years and years. He's been an art dealer since the late 1970s. And his professional focus has been on works of works on paper and therefore um, you see this beautiful print exhibition from American and European artists. His, he's been a vice president of the American Historical Print Collectors Society. He's a former board member of the um, International Fine Print Dealers Association. He's been very involved in numerous other print associations I can um, could name. He calls himself a fanatic enthusiast of Francis Gearhart, and he, with uh, Susan Futterman, curated the retrospective for the Pasadena Museum of California Art retrospective for Gearhart, and he curated um, our own show of color wood brought prints um, in Wichita. So without further ado, Roger, we're thrilled to have you here in Wichita. We can't wait to hear from you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to... Forgive me, I gotta, I'm about 20 feet from the closest person. I just want to point that out. Uh, well, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Patricia for actually uh, uh, having this show to, and, and accepting the uh, proposal. And most of all, Barbara Thompson, who was the really the impetus for doing this and asked me, I think I figured out four years ago, uh, the uh, now uh, infamous question, uh, would you like to do a Gerhardt show? And I said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but four years later, here we are. And there's a catalog uh, I, that I hope you will buy at some point. And also, I wanted to thank what I've been calling the Gerhardt team. I mean, this museum has been so supportive of me. And I just wanted to say that there are no strings attached. I, there are no limitations uh, on anything I did. Uh, I just did what I wanted to do. And I think that's just a gift that I will, will keep on giving. Uh, Tara Hedrick is the curator who uh, was, uh, I work with quite closely in the last couple of months. Leslie Cervantes, the registrar, accepted uh, something like 75 items. I kept shipping to her every, seems every week I was, she was getting more things to catalog. Uh, and Rebecca Williams and Kirk in the, uh, who, who uh, set up the show and they, I called them the Gerhardt team. So thank you to all of them. Uh, so I'm calling this talk Francis Gerhardt from here to there and back. 
Uh, and that's because she started here. Uh, she's regarded as one of America's foremost woodcut artists. And from here. And just to give you an idea, she was born in Henderson County, Gladstone, the city, the town, in January 4th, 1869. So she's a native mid Midwesterner. And on this little map I prepared, the lower left is Wichita. Uh, this is the interstate, which I think was not there in 1888, uh, I think. Uh, it may have been what the Chisholm Trail, I don't know what it was. And in the upper right corner is Gladstone, which is uh, about 500 miles, 498 on the interstate. Uh, and above that, I have a little inset because she, the family spent uh, a couple of years in uh, Iowa, in Independence, Iowa. So that's a, it's 150 miles north of Gladstone. Uh, just to get a little bit of differences of geography, uh, these are pictures of Midwest, Henderson County, Gladstone. Uh, the, the one that's on the right and, and on the left is... Uh, Independence, Iowa, which uh, has some snow on it. And I'll tell you why about the snow in a second. So this is what Gerhardt saw when she came to California. Decidedly different. This is Pasadena. Uh, that's uh, the San Gabriel Mountains behind uh, Mount Wilson, which is uh, you know, near 10,000 feet. And to the east by several miles is Big Bear Lake and uh, Mount Baldy, where she spent a lot of time where they had a cabin, which I'll talk about later. So this is what she saw when she got there on the ground. Orange groves. Uh, in the distance is Pasadena. These photographs are from 1888. That's a detail of Pasadena. And that's what they found when they got to Pasadena. Now they were in LA a, a little bit before this, but this is where they ended up. And she died in here. So she had two sisters, uh, Edna and May, and Edna uh, her, and her father was Stephen, and Emma was her mother. And Edna was a ten, uh, 11 years her junior. And when they arrived in Pasadena in 1888, uh, she was 10. And she was a, obviously a child prodigy because she wrote a, a, an article that was published in the LA Times in 1888. It's unbelievable. And I just want to read this because it's such a wonderful thing, re making reference back to the snow. She said, I came from Independence, Iowa, and live in Pasadena, California. I would not exchange California and the oranges for all the coasting on the snow in Independence. I went coasting a, quite a great deal in, in, in the winter there. I am eight years old. So that's her sister. And the, the three sisters all were involved in the school system in LA. So they're obviously quite bright people. And she, you know, this is an eight-year-old. So this is a little bit more of a, what she would have found. These are orange groves. These photographs are all 1888. Her father, Stephen, Stephen was uh, a, uh, an apiary, a bee raiser. And that's an 1888 picture of bees, beehives in, in the San Gabriel Valley in 1888, or around, probably 1892, I would say. Uh, this is the Chamber of Commerce view, Old Baldy, which is to the east by several miles, and the orange groves. And this is about 1920, but I decided I'd throw it in because it kind of shows the romanticism of what was taking place and what you know drew, drew people from the Midwest to come to California and to settle in in uh, in Pasadena. So this is Gerhardt, what she looked like in 1891 at the age of 22. So it's not too far after she too long after she arrived in Pasadena, and this was the her state normal school photograph from 1891. And uh, she was involved uh, in the school system, as were all the teachers, all the uh, sisters. And in uh, 1897, she went to Berkeley up in Northern California, near San Francisco, and graduated there in, eight, in 1901. And her, her two sisters all, uh, joined her later, and uh, they kind of followed each other, and particularly May. And I'll talk a little bit about May a little later. Now, when she was in Northern California, she probably, she was there for four years, and so she probably s s traveled all around the area, uh, poking around in the landscape and the coastal area, and it's, it's quite gorgeous up there, especially those years when there are no people. So she was very much influenced by that landscape, as was May, who she uh, spent a lot of time with. Uh, oops, I'm going backwards, sorry. <laughs> Wrong button, excuse me. Oh. I pushed the wrong button. Okay, the earliest inclinations of Ger Gerhardt as an artist. Uh, 
In 1982, the Gerhard estate essentially came on the market from a neighbor at Dawson's Bookshop. And Dawson's Bookshop was one of the premier and still exists in the third generation as a photography dealer, started in 1905. And they ended up with the Gerhardt, uh, essentially the, the Gerhardt estate. And it's this little catalog on the right is just full of all kinds of amazing rarities that you know, I've never, you know, I've never seen, again, I've never seen then and will probably never find because I don't know where they were dispersed to. And I wanna point out particularly where the arrow is, uh, it mentions uh, a book by John Muir, uh, the, Cabins of Cal the Mountains of California. And on between pages 98 and 143, there are three watercolor vignettes and 26 pages with floral borders, all painted by Francis Gerhardt. And then below that is a, uh, a reference to an early watercolor, one of her very earliest, 1907. So what might that little thing look like? I've not seen it. It's probably lost or it's in some collection. I'll never find it. So recently I came across this very rare early book by Gerhardt. Uh, it's all manuscript. It's a strange set of poems about Africa. And if you notice the border illustrations are these little color, color vignettes and watercolors. And so I would say I would probably date this around that 1904 time. And I would venture to guess that uh, it probably looks something like that. Uh, you know, the reference to the 1907 watercolor was the earliest in that little catalog by Dawson's, but this is uh, the earliest watercolor I've found that's dated, 1906, Road to Monterey. And again, she was spent so much time in that area, so it's not unlikely that, you know, she spent time in Monterey and, and all of the coastal area. And uh, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a watercolor, but I wouldn't write home about it to anyone about it. It's not brilliant, but it's, uh, it is early and it's quite small. And it's the same size as the one in the Dawson's catalog. I think it's five by seven inches. Uh, in 1909, she obviously was established as an artist because the LA Times had an article that said, Miss Frances Gerhardt, who was a very fine artist, will take her vacation in Bolina, sketch sketching among the redwoods. Uh, excuse me, that was a photograph actually of Bolinas in 1909. So that's where she was going up to. But more than that, the landscape looks like this. This is a modern photograph, obviously. And the redwoods are up there, but they're not in this photograph. And she didn't really do much on red, with redwoods, but, but the watercolors are, uh, reflect the sort of rolling hills landscape. This is a, a watercolor dated 1909. So this may be one of those watercolors that was done when she went up there. Uh, this is a watercolor, this one's in the show, and this is dated 1910. So you get the idea that she was uh, you know, quite, a, quite a good art, a watercolorist. And the thing I wanna really bring out in all of this is that she doesn't come out, a lot of people talk about her influence of the Japanese prints and all of that. She came out of the California painting school. She went to, uh, uh, sorry, she, uh, studied with Henry uh, R. Poor and Charles Woodbury in the East, uh, uh, one of her only times that she actually studied uh, away from California, who were traditional American painters. And so these, this style is, is completely, you know, American straightforward realism in California. It's, it's not any Japanese influence at all. And, uh, and the one, uh, uh, Sorry, uh, and this is a similar watercolor. Uh, and the interesting thing about this one is that it's dedicated to the sorority Gamma Phi Beta, which was her sorority. So she, it was a special watercolor for her and it's quite nice and it's a fairly large size as well. Uh, and you get, you get the idea. I mean, she was just a really good painter. This is a gorgeous seascape. I don't know where it is. It could have been Northern California. It could be, you know, somewhere in Southern California. It's probably Northern California. And you get the idea that, you know, she's a traditional painter. She's not a, a Japanese influenced person by any means. And she did the watercolors for, you know, a dozen years before she made her first prints. Uh, this one is just a luscious painting. Uh, look at those flowers on the, the path leading you into the distance. It's just a Beautiful, beautiful painting. And uh, that's a kind of a theme that is the path leading into the distance that she used a lot. 
in her compositions. Uh, there's another watercolor. I'm just going to go through a couple of them. And this is uh, the reflections in the water. And you can see she's just really good. Uh, and then she works, she starts to get into woodcuts or uh, block prints. And it's not a bold leap then to go from that watercolor on the left to one of her very earliest prints on the right. I mean, the subject matter is not the same. One has a river, one has a path, you know, but you get the idea that, you know, she was translating at that point, trying to move into, into printmaking, but that's where she came from. But she wasn't always good. This is an excellent print. And it's interesting, uh, this is a sense of scale. Uh, this watercolor on the left is 14 by 18 inches. And the one on the right is four by three inches, a little more than that. And that's the magical thing of putting things against each other. You can play with space. Uh, and then how, how, how did that influence her later prints? Uh, uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about, uh, throughout the lecture, I'm going to make references in the slides, side-by-side uh, -side images. And they're not necessarily the same year, but they show how she moved from one to the other easily over, over de a decade. And the one on the left, I don't know the date specifically, but most of her watercolors are you know, 1915, 1910. And so I'm gonna call it 1912. Uh, and the one on the right is, is known as 1930, uh, still water. But you can see the relationship. It's, it's, it's quite profound. And she does come out of that traditional California landscape painting school. Uh, the one on the left, maybe those redwood trees, I don't know when it was painted. And the one on the right is, uh, shrine to Pan, and you can see they're not identical, but they're really similar. And what's interesting about these two uh, pieces of art is that they're the identical size. They're 11 and a half by six inches. Now, whether it was a study for the print, I don't know, but uh, perhaps. Oops, I did it again. Sorry, I keep pushing the wrong button. But she wasn't all that skilled at the beginning. She was struggling to make prints. And the, the one on the left is a very early print. It's a cabin, probably in an area uh, of Big Bear, at a place called Fonskin, which they ultimately bought a cabin about a year later, the sisters did. And they lived up in that area off and on for you know, decades. And the print on the right is by May Gerhardt, who I've made a reference to earlier. Uh, May did color etchings, uh, and they both exhibited together over many years. Uh, uh, but Frances was the superior artist, I think. May was a rather mixed bag, in my view. But she did produce some interesting prints. And this one in particular is interesting because it's Fonskin, where they bought a cabin in 1920. And it was uh, exhibited in, in, in the Chicago Society of Etchers uh, exhibition uh, in 1920. So she was exhibited as well. They were, they were kind of parallel uh, people. But Frances kind of passed her, you know, went far beyond her. So she had a number of early influences uh, among the California school, as I mentioned, among them the California school, but also a little bit of Art Nouveau kind of floats in a little uh, you know, at the beginning. This book plate is 1907, uh, Francis Gerhardt's book plate. And the print on the right is uh, one of her earliest prints uh, called High Tide, 1918 uh, or so. And I wouldn't call it Art Nouveau specifically, or Art Nouveau style, but it has these elements of the curvilinear uh, uh, things that Art Nouveau has. And, and it's quite, I think, indicative of one of the influences that she had. Uh, and on the right uh, is a similar kind of print. So for those of you who argue that Japanese prints is the major influence in her life, I'm gonna throw you a bone. This is Hokusai's favorite, famous, the great wave. Uh, does that look like, whoops, sorry. Does that look like that? I don't think so. But you, one might argue that she was influenced by Japanese prints, perhaps in this print. Uh, she did a lot of figurative prints early on. Again, uh, these are very early, 1918. Uh, she was not very good at it, I don't think. Uh, this is one of the earliest ones. Uh, called Cross Lots, which, which was actually exhibited uh, in 1920 a couple of times. 
But you can see she's struggling with the figures. So she didn't really do figures very well. The interesting thing about this in the next couple of prints is I'm going to kind of stress what is in the background because she's beginning to develop her landscape style, you know, the, the technique she used. And the early years, it's kind of linear like this with little dots and uh, lines. That's how, how she defined form and cl clouds. And then I, in the center, I have a detail of the uh, of the landscape, so you can kind of get an idea. Uh, this next slide is called, uh, I call the mother and child. And again, uh, it's, it's the, the figure is rather primitive, but the landscape itself is quite beautiful. And it's, it's very much in the arts and crafts style. This could be a stained glass window. Uh, it, it's, it's just one of those prints that she did that kind of, kind of stands out because of that. And in the middle, I have a detail of that Art Nouveau book plate. And so uh, you could see a little bit of that in there too. I mean, she's drawing from a lot of sources and uh, that's certainly one of them. It's just a, it's, a, it's a lovely little print and it's very, very early. And again, another uh, uh, figurative print, the figures I think are rather clumsy and unconvincing. But behind it, look at the landscape. That sort of suggests a lot of the stuff that she was doing later on. Uh, those beautiful trees, and you'll see a, a one print in particular that kind of has that kind of style. But she did do figures in the later years. Ten years later, she and her sisters worked on a book, a proposed book that was never published until uh, by the uh, California Book Club uh, uh, ten years ago, called the Let's Play series. And Clearly, she did the woodblocks, and clearly she's now mature. And I'm going to show a number of these uh, the, the juxtaposition between her early work and her later work to see how she really matures. And this is one case where you can really see how she develops form and volume and everything, because it's just such a difference uh, in, this, in these two images. And she dabbled with flowers. Uh, she was an amateur gardener, but she made very few actual uh, pure uh, flower prints. I think I've identified perhaps seven. Uh, she probably did more, but I just haven't seen them. Uh, and these are examples of her uh, floral prints. Uh, I'm basically trying to, in the, in the beginning of this lecture, I'm talking about kind of before she got to Wichita. And so this is just examples of the kinds of work she did. This was not in Wichita, but uh, I'm just trying to show a kind of cross-section of what she did do. And she did very early Christmas cards, uh, 1918, 1920. Uh, the, sorry, uh, these are actually block prints, the, the text. And the inside of, the, of them looks like this. Uh, and uh, note the slide on the right and the sky that you see, because you're going to see that again uh, in a larger version. These are quite small, they're about uh, four inches or something like that. They're little Christmas cards. And she did this regularly for several years, but seems, most of them seem to be very early. The one on the left is a block print, black and white. The one in the center, again, has that early uh, landscape style. But what's unusual about this particular print in the center is that it has no key block. And she used the thing called the key block, which is um, particularly note, you can note it on the right, that, that surrounds and defines the forms. It defines the, uh, the uh, area within the, which outlines the color and also puts a, a frame around the print. And, and 99 out of 100 Gerhardt's will have the key block. This is very unusual in that it doesn't have it. Now, she had a number of influences and she was active in the print clubs. And uh, one of the major influences in her life, I think, uh, in a lot of the school in California was Arthur Dow, Arthur W. Dow, who was a teacher influential printmaker, professor at Pratt in Columbia. And he made two trips to California, one in 1911 and one in 1919. And in 1919, he spent some time in uh, LA, about several months on a sabbatical. And he gave a series of very influential lectures. And they had a, a meeting with the uh, printmakers of Los Angeles, uh, where Gerhard was beginning to be involved. And, uh, and he, he was very influential uh, because he reflected this sort of, again, this Japanese sensibility 
uh, and, and certain technical virtuosity. And uh, when he was coming out to California, he made a series of, series of sketches. Uh, and the one on the left uh, is uh, the, from the sketchbook. Uh, of, and it's a model for the, oh, there's supposed to, I lost the slide. There's actually four, it's in the show downstairs. There's actually there somewhere dropped out. There's four different versions of that one on the right. Uh, that's too bad. It's it kind of interesting. Somehow I lost it in the slide presentation. Now, after Dow was here, she really changes her style. Uh, here, if there's any Japanese influence, uh, it, it may have come from Dow, as well as maybe looking at Japanese prints over the years. And I'm going to go back to this slide on the left, which is the one I showed earlier. And then on the right is uh, probably after Dow was there. It's the, it's the Colorado Street Bridge in Pasadena. And you can see how she's starting to develop a more of a signature style, but it's still a kind of a flat planes. It's not dimensional like your later work is. And if you look at the bridge, it's a beautiful bridge. It has this sort of little Art Nouveau elements to it. And uh, uh, that's sort of why I included that. It's a, it's a very early print, probably 1919. Again, I'm going to compare that print of the bridge with a later print that she did of the bridge in Big Sur in 1933. So this is another dramatic uh, 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 showing of, of how her style really matures. It's not flat, it's dimensional, it has volume you know, on the right. Not that the print on the left is not good, but that's more of the Francis Gerhardt that came to be on the one on the right. And again, it's the Big Sur coast, so she's spent a lot of time up there certainly and uh, was, you know, the subject matter was used a lot, not the Bixer Bridge, but the, uh, the coastal scene in Central California. Uh, again, these are a couple other prints uh, that are kind of post Dalian, uh, I call them, uh, 1919 roughly. The one on the right, you remember that figure uh, where I highlighted the, the foliage in the background, it sort of comes out in this print a little bit on the left of the, uh, after the rain, the print on the right. Uh, and then she did this print in 1920, and it's called On the Salinas River. On the Salinas River is really her most important early print. It may not be a, her best early print, but this was the print that was selected by the printmakers of Los Angeles, uh, who were a group of uh, a, a print, uh, it's a pr print club, and they, they did prints. And, and uh, th this print was chosen as their first print judged by her peers. So she was already, she had just been making prints a year or two, and all of a sudden she's been picked as, you know, the signature print for the society. So that's quite significant, I think. Uh, and they did the presentation prints, not unlike what, what came to be with the Woodcut Society of Kansas City. There's similar kinds of things, uh, but it predates that by about 10 years. They were in little folders. Uh, actually, the folder of this is in the show downstairs. Uh, so you get an idea about that. So I call 1922 as the pivotal year. Uh, and why do I say that? Uh, well, I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, she was included in a, in a show at the Smithsonian in, uh, in the Corcoran Gallery in February. It was her first appearance in Wichita in March. And by the end of 1922, she opened the Gerhardt studio in their home. And that became really the epicenter for uh, printmaking and uh, print connoisseurship and shows in Los Angeles for a number of years, probably a decade. So again, there's, there's very few pictures of Gerhard. Uh, I showed the one earlier from 1891, and there's a couple other uh, school pictures, but, but there's really very few. This, this is a, a silhouette portrait by one of her contemporary artists, uh, Orpha Klinker, and you get the idea of what she looked like around 1922, which is when all this was going on. So she opened the Gerhardt studio uh, again in 1922. This is a letter that she wrote to a number of artists, including people like Gustav Baumann and others, soliciting work for the gallery. And she says, quote, this will be the only place in Southern California devoted exclusively to the sale of prints. So that's important. And it's, it's also interesting because it outlines the terms. She took a third. Uh, uh, she had no fire insurance. 
So they're on their own. The place burns down. She's not responsible. Little things like that are in this letter. And it's quite interesting. Uh, it's interesting, actually, it was written to the wife of uh, Ralph Pearson, who was uh, the, one of the, you know, he, was he a prairie printmaker? I don't know. But anyway, he, he, uh, his wife writes a little note in there and says something like, uh, you, you should definitely send prints to this, this, this show because they have money in Pasadena. And the gallery uh, was quite a center. And this is just a wonderful, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's quite, it's quite long. I'm going to read just a couple of phrases. Uh, this is by a reviewer who came to uh, sh see the show for the first time at the Gerhardt studio. And he says, I almost passed it. So unpretentious was the exterior. Unlike humans whose souls are revealed by their faces, the souls of houses are not revealed by their facades. However, this particular house has a soul. Francis Gerhardt, the artist, lives there, surrounded by color and beauty of block prints and etchings, the finest to be had in the land. And then he goes on about describing the studio. But it's just, it's just a wonderful description, you know, because who knows what it looked like, really. I, I don't know if there's any photographs of it. There must be somewhere, but I've never seen them. Uh, so again, 1922 is the significant year. So I've called this, this is the back part of from here to there and back. Uh, Gerhardt returns to Wichita. So in 1922, the Wichita Art Association hosted the exhibition Woodblock Prints in Color by Leading American Artists, wood, American Woodblock Artists at the Wichita Library, which I had the honor of seeing today, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, it's a Carnegie Library, quite a beautiful building and quite a fantastic restoration job. If you've never been there, you should see it. And the prints that were in, the print that was likely in that show, and there's no, there's no actual list of the actual prints, there's a list of the artists, is probably High Skies on the left uh, from 1921, but the exhibition was 1922, but this is dated 1921, but often, you know, prints will be in an exhibition if it's done in December, it ends up in, in March, you know, so it's not necessarily a, a, a wrong year. And then in 1923, the Wichita Art Association and Wichita Public Library hosted an exhibition organized by the printmakers of Los Angeles, the one that she's involved with, and Fisherman's Cove was one of those three prints, uh, probably, because it's listed in a, number, in a similar show in that same year. And I want to particularly emphasize, uh, well, the one on the left is just an absolutely gorgeous print. It's just one of her absolute top early compositions. The, the vividness of the colors and the swirling sky and all of that is present in both of them. But that one on the left is just so gorgeous. Uh, and the one on the right uh, is likely that print. Uh, so now we're going to go skip a few years and we're, we're back and she's, you know, she exhibited between 23 and, and 28. There's one other exhibition and possibly in Wichita that the Printmaker Society came through, I think, in 1927, but I've not found any list of the prints. Uh, so this is the annual, what was then became, and this is the focus of the show, really, is the prints that were in the annual uh, Wichita prints, uh, uh, the, the annual exhibition of the American block prints at the, uh, uh, exhibited at the library. And they were exhibited from 1928 to 1937, and she was in the first one. This is one of the prints in that show. And uh, uh, it was uh, also uh, one of the chosen prints of the 50 prints of the year uh, in uh, that same year. So it was quite an exceptional print and is probably the highlight of that of the show. And she had 10 prints in that show. I want to, I don't, I don't think I said that. Uh, and that was the most of any printmaker. Uh, there were two others who had 10 prints as well. And she was one of the three. Uh, so I'm now I'm going to talk a little bit about subject matter again. Uh, I'm just going to go through quickly. This is, uh, I'm going to go through fast because this is in the exhibition. But uh, she did the clouds. And uh, you realize, oh, sorry, it wasn't on the right slide. See how her volume of the clouds, if you go back to those, the Fisherman's Cove and the other ones, they're, they're just, uh, they're flat virtually, but the one on the left has such volume. She just really matures in those, in the later years. Uh, and 
Uh, and again, she's returning to the coast because her subject matter, on the one on the right. And the interesting thing about the cloud prints is that, I didn't mention that earlier, is that the white is actually the paper. They're not a printed white. So she's using the paper block as, as, the, as the color. Uh, two more Central California prints. The one on the left called Morning on the Elkhorn, the 1929. Kind of recalls, if you know Dow's prints at all, the, the Marsh prints that he did uh, in Ipswich uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, has a little bit of that feeling, although this is bigger trees. And again, I'm going to go back to that Fisherman's Cove and show the later work that was in the uh, Wichita exhibitions on the right. And you see how she's treating a similar subject uh, with a different kind of compositional treatment and a, a really a maturity of form and volume and distance and atmospheric perspective. The, the, the kind of a dramatic difference. And it's almost like the, the, the two bridge prints. Uh, and as I mentioned, May and Francis uh, really were together quite a lot. They exhibited together. And this is a, the only instance I've ever seen where they overlap completely in subject matter. The print on the left is Francis's The Sand Spit, which is in the exhibition. And so is the one on the right, which is May's, May Gerhardt's etching. And they're identical compositions, same, same place, obviously. And Gerhardt, when she when he, she titled her prints, it's, it's almost always a poetic title, and it's very rare that she actually says where it is. It's very frustrating for someone trying to do scholarship on it because you have to kind of deduce where it might be. I mean, sometimes there's one called Lake Tahoe, you know, the, you know, you know where it is. There's one called Zion, so I know she was once in, in Zion National Park. Uh, there's a couple in, in uh, Mount Hood, for example, but very rarely. But the one that May did is called Morro Bay. Straightforward, we know where it is, so now we know where Francis Print is, it's Morrow Bay, which is kind of a moral victory for me. Uh, so I just wanna talk a little bit more about May because she's so important in all of this, but you know, she, as I said, she had a mixed uh, uh, performance, I think. These are three kind of nice examples uh, of her color etching. She did black and white etching. The one in the center is particularly interesting because it's called High Country. And if you look in the distance, High Sierra Country, and so it says that it's the Sierras, and you might otherwise think that it's the uh, Fonskin or Big Bear Lake, but uh, it puts it up there. And Francis did a print called Lake Tahoe. So it could be that they went up to Lake Tahoe together. Uh, that lake just is too big to not be a known, known lake. So I suspect it could be, and that's in the Sierras. So it very well could be Lake Tahoe. Uh, this is the exciting print. Uh, this is the actual print that was in the exhibitions and. Wichita in 1931, it has the label, as you see on the left. It's a gorgeous print, uh, uh, When Summer Comes, 1931. And then I'm gonna do a little, show a little bit about the compositional treatments and, and you know, interest that she had in this spatial relationship of paths, which I mentioned early on in that early watercolor. Uh, it's a theme that she liked, and this is two good examples, both in the exhibition uh, of her, her wonderful depth and atmospheric perspective and compositional treatment of, of, of the way things recede in space. Uh, the print on, uh, these are two prints that are a Big Bear Lake. Uh, the one on the left is probably, arguably her most Japanese print. Uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful composition. Uh, and this one uh, won awards and was uh, on the cover uh, down in the show, you'll see a little uh, uh, brochure of the Grand Central, oops, the Grand Central Library, uh, Grand Central Art Gallery in New York, uh, which was her first show in New York. She, so she might, finally made it to Manhattan uh, in 1931 in that show. And the one on the right is uh, a glimpse of Big Bear Lake. Uh, what's interesting, again, with the titles, this print is normally called Autumn Brocades or in the Wichita catalog was called Autumn Brocades, The Range. But this particular impression actually came from the Gerhard estate and it's titled Glimpse of Big Bear Lake. So again, kind of moral victory, we know where it is. It's not some you know, other place that we don't have any idea. Cause there's a little lake in the background. Uh, and she did other mountainscapes. Uh, one on the left, I'm not sure where that is, but it has a similar composition to the print on the right. 
which is Old Baldy. And Old Baldy was uh, not far east of their place in Fonskin. So she would have seen this regularly because the tower is above the San Gabriel Valley uh, to the east of Pasadena by about 50 miles. And then I want to talk a little bit about her printmaking uh, techniques. Uh, she used this key block and every Gerhardt print is unique. Uh, the way she applies the ink, the way she layers the ink, uh, she will sometimes change blocks or she'll, she'll ink something so heavily that the ridge lines of a mountain will disappear. But she, just, she also changed the color of the key block. So here we have on the left, uh, a, a black, you know, the black key block and on the right, the blue key block. But then she threw me a curveball. Look at the print on the right. She changed the middle block. It's totally different. And uh, a kind of a little anecdote, when uh, Susan and I were organizing a show about 10 years ago, we came to a private collection. And whenever I, I uh, go to see prints, I, I, I have several Gerhards. And I tr if I have an example of what I'm going to go see, I try and bring an example. So I brought, I, I had both of these prints. So I brought both of these prints over to this guy's house. And we laid out his print and my prints. And we're going back and forth and going, something's not right here. And I realized in the end that she had completely changed the central block. Uh, just a few more, oops, sorry, a few more examples of her uh, mountainscapes. Uh, Sierra Skyscrapers on the left is one of her largest prints. Uh, and on the right is the wilderness. And again, we're getting toward the end of this Wichita period. And I want to make one more argument for her uh, reflecting the California painting style. This is the last print that Gerhardt showed in Wichita, 1937, A Star Country. Uh, and on the right is a painting by one of the premier California landscape painters, Edgar Payne. Payne's a major figure in California art, big bucks. And, you know, they're so similar in feeling. I mean, there's a little bit of difference in the composition. The left, the, the Gerhardt has trees and this has a the other one has water, but you really get a sense that she's coming out of the California school in this. Uh, one of the, her premier prints is Austerity. Uh, it was the year before the last print of, that she showed in Wichita. And this is one of those examples where she changed the block. If you look on the left, uh, you see there's, there's uh, in the snowbank in the foreground, there's uh, these ridges, the, the lines that define the ridge. And the one on the right, uh, they've been removed. And that's how you generally find it, not that it's a common print, but I think the one on the left, she changed, she changed the composition a lot because it's a monumental print. If you look, when you go downstairs, you'll see it. It's the biggest print she made, Austerity. And when she took away the kind of distracting uh, lines in the snow on the left, it becomes more monumental than it would have otherwise, I think. That's my argument. And I think that was more successful uh, in doing that. And then it's interesting, uh, Susan had found this and I realized that I actually had found that some reference, I wrote a note to myself about 10 years ago, that this print on the right, which is also in the exhibition, uh, uh, is called Fall. And it's the same composition, but it's in reverse and slightly smaller. So she did that from time to time. Uh, and on the left is uh, an article. This is her last known lifetime exhibition, which was at the Tucson Fine Arts Society in November 23rd, 1941. Uh, and I would say it was two, year, two weeks before Pearl Harbor. So all of a sudden, you know, the world is in a different place, a little bit like today, but this is not a war. It's a different kind of war. Uh, and she lived another 17 years after this. Uh, but this is, I, I've not found another reference to a show that she was in after 1941. They probably were, but I, I've not found them. And on the right is her obituary. Uh, very short. It has a date that she arrived in 19, 1890, which may be wrong, probably wrong. We have records going back to 1888 in Pasadena at least. And if you notice, there's not one mention of Francis Gerhardt as a printmaker or as an artist which is kind of sad. Uh, 
there are uh, four prints in this exhibition that are missing. Uh, there's, there's three that are not in the show that I, I couldn't find actual prints for. The images are not are known. But for all those people out there, I'm hoping someone will find one of these prints. These are four prints that are, are in the exhibition as listed, but we've never seen any images of them. So some of them are rare, and these are four of the rarest. And that's about all I have to say about Francis Gerhardt. Thank you. Now, as far as the Zoom things, are there questions from people coming in? Or is there any, maybe we should do the audience? Or I don't know, how, how's that work? Okay, they're hearing me in the room and on Zoom. The way we thought we'd work questions, Roger, is we can um, take questions from in the room and on Zoom, because I'm standing here um, with the prerogative of a microphone in my hand. I, I might start with one just to get the ball rolling. And you didn't tell us, how do, do you know, how do you think the connection happened for her to be invited here? Who did the invitation? Does she accept immediately? Do we have any of that kind of documentation? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I think she may have had some contact with Seward. You know, he was kind of the impetus for all of this. Uh, I know she, she worked with Bertha Jaquies, who she was very well connected. So her connection to Wichita, uh, I don't know how exactly that first show, 1922, came to be, but where she was in. But she, the, the print club circulated. And that, the, 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 the 22 show, was uh, I think just a, a pure Wichita show. So Seward must have had something to do with it. The 23 show was an exhibition of the printmakers, the LA printmakers that, that traveled around. So that one probably came as a, as a set of prints from other people. Uh, I don't know direct contact with Wichita at, at, at all, but you know, at this point she had a reputation. You know, she was exhibited and, and uh, so uh, it, it's just, I think by reputation. So, so did I hear you say that the 22 color wood block show here, it did not travel, it was only here. I believe that was, uh, okay. I think Barbara would know. I think it was just a, right. a unique show. Okay. Oh, how, yeah, Hal Brown. Yeah, that we could were, be. We're, yeah, uh, yeah that, that, that's, that, that could very well could be. Hal Brown and Benjamin Brown were two brothers in, in LA, in Pasadena. And uh, Benjamin Brown in particular was an important painter. And Hal Brown, and, and uh, they, they corresponded a lot. He was, the secretary of, of the uh, print club and uh, at, at, or the president, at, uh, actually. And uh, he promoted her a lot. Uh, and uh, that could be very well be that, how that happened. Uh, he probably communicated with Seward. Yeah, there's a letter, isn't there, from Brown? Yeah, right. I was hoping to have that in the, I forgot that. I was hoping to have that in the exhibition, but we didn't get it in because it was difficult. But uh, you know, the, the, all these print clubs wrote, you know, the, the presidents and the, you know, the secretaries corresponded and they were known to each other. Uh, and there's so many of these traveling shows, there's a lot of them. And you know, they ended up in, a, you know, in the catalog uh, that I did, the, uh, I think I have 150 exhibitions and a lot of them are just traveling print clubs. Okay. Uh, the important thing about these these print uh, club exhibitions that went all over the country, this is how the artists not only made their reputations, but made their living. As you saw from the label, there was a price. And even the exhibitions at the Chicago Art Institute or the LA Museum or Wichita, all these prints were for sale. So this was a way that artists made a living. So they were eager to get into these shows over and over again. Yeah, and to that point, there's a show, there's a, in the exhibition, uh, there's a, one print called Serenity. I just, you know, I had so many slides, I hope I didn't have too many, but there, there are three examples of that print, or actually two different colors and one in reverse. But that was exhibited at the 1928 Smithsonian show. And the only correspondence we have with Gerhardt was with uh, Raul Tolman, who was their curator. And he's writing to her about the fact that Serenity sold very well. 
uh, I think five impressions of Serenity were sold. And that's the same year that it was in the exhibition in Wichita. So that is one vehicle. Uh, and she was very excited, by the way, that her stuff was selling so well. And he recommended she contact a gallery in Washington to help. So we have a question from our Zoom audience, Roger. Okay. Um, you know, for the, for the general public, can you say something about the color woodblock print technique? Okay, I well, happen to know it's super complicated. Well, first of all, uh, and I tried so hard, and I don't think I ever said woodcut. I, mean, I may have accidentally. They're all linoleum cuts in the case of Garrett. I mean, there may be maybe a couple very, very early ones that are woodcuts, but she used linoleum, not wood. So that in and of itself is a, is a different medium. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a much more malleable, carvable process uh, on the block. And each block is a different color. Uh, each color, I should say, is a different block. And they're laid over each other. And she would, she would print on, you know, the colors would overlay and that's how she would get some of the depth. And she would sometimes wipe out a, 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 a ridge in, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a crag in the, in the background. And then she in particular used the thing called the key block. And the key block is that outline block that I mentioned, uh, uh, like in the last few slides, the color, one was blue, <coughs> sorry, one was blue, one was black, and it defines the form. And uh, uh, she used that extensively, un unlike a lot of printmakers. William Rice, another Californian, used that technique a lot. Uh, but each block is colored individually, uh, put in a, a presumably Gerhardt uh, printed in a little uh, like a, a frame thing and they put the block in and every Gerhardt print, if it's not trimmed, has little tack holes, tack holes on the right side of it, which means that they were, she tacked it down to the, to the uh, uh, block upside down, uh, you know, uh, and she'd rub on the back uh, to, to transfer the ink from the block. She lift it up, put a new block in, do the same thing. And that's, so that's how I know that she actually attached them to this block. Everyone has these little tack holes and they're generally rubbed from the back. Uh, but each, each print is different because each one is, is uh, individually inked. And with the uh, uh, linoleum blocks, uh, you often can see the texture of the brush strokes in the sky or in the, the you know, the, it was like a pure color form within the composition. You often can see the brush strokes and I, I mentioned uh, everyone is unique. You can always tell one Gerhardt from another because everyone is different. It's not like Bauman who was very meticulous in having them be identical. Uh, they, they are always very obviously different in some little minute way and it might be just the strokes of the brush. Uh, and it's just a remarkable way that she did it. And she, she can be sloppy too. From time to time, she drops ink in the, in the sky or uh, you know, in the, in the key block and around the edges. So, but she's, it's pure arts and crafts. It's pure, it's just pure beauty in, in, a, in a very spontaneous way. Oh, there's a question in the back. Well, that's a good question. Hang on a second, let me, if you don't mind, let me repeat that. What was the addition size for many of her prints? Well, it's a good question. And, and she, uh, you know, a lot of artists numbered prints. She numbered very, very few prints. And so on, in some cases, uh, uh, like for example, the, uh, 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 the one that's in the exhibition with the label says uh, edition of 50, but artists don't always complete the editions. And so I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of Gerhardts and some of them are, don't, don't ever come up. They're very rare, or maybe they're all destroyed. But I would guess that on the average, they're probably 20 to 30. In the early years, I think they're even rarer than that. I, I, Cause they're, they're just, you know, she didn't make very many. Uh, the one print I, I mentioned uh, that was in the first uh, Wichita exhibition, that was uh, one of the 50 prints of the year. So, and that one is actually numbered 50, actually has a number. Very unusual. I have another print by her that's number 35, but nine times, 99 out of 100 are not numbered. So you have to kind of assume and all of the annotations on the labels, uh, well, if they have one, it's, uh, not all of them, but many say 50, but I'm not convinced you ever made 50 because some of them are just too rare. Like those four missing ones. But they're, they're clearly not more than 50. And in the Christmas cards, uh, by the way, they were a little more common. Uh, and on a rare occasion, you'll see one of them numbered 75. 
like slash 75, but that was intended to be, uh, uh, you know, Christmas cards. So they were distributed more widely. We have, we have an interesting question from our Zoom audience. Someone is interested in knowing, did she, would you know, did she exhibit or sell with the Carl Smalley Gallery here in McPherson, Kansas? Oh, I have no idea, but I, I, I hope that it's true because there might be more records somewhere. <laughs> yeah, he, he's not aware, and Barbara Thompson, who's quite the pre printmaker aficionado scholar, she's, she, she doubts it. So. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the gallery either. Is that a local gallery? It's, um, a, another comment, comment question. Um, someone from the Zoom audience wonders, it looks like some of the blocks had more than one color on it. And is that the case? Would you know? Uh, possibly she did do that. In, you know, she, in the inking, though, you can vary the, 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 the uh, uh, depth of the, of the ink that's applied. So it might appear lighter or, or, or not, depending on how much, how thick the ink application was. By the way, she used oil-based inks. That's important. Uh, another differentiation from Japanese prints, which are water-based. Her inks are, are oil-based. So she had her own way of doing things. Uh, and that's an important distinction. So she was using oil-based inks on top of a linoleum block. Uh, you know, where the, where she, she could have, uh, you know, brushed the different colors on a block, but I think it's more common for them just to be variations in the way they were inked with the brush. She didn't always sign her right. prints. That's, that's right, that's true. Uh, and that's not necessarily an indication of quality with her work. Uh, I've had Gerhards that are better than ones that are signed, that are unsigned. It's just somehow they don't, they don't get signed. Sometimes artists don't sign an edition or they sign them when they sell them. Uh, uh, in the case of Gerhardt, uh, there's nothing wrong with an unsigned print. Uh, you know, just people buy autographs sometimes. Uh, We have another interesting technique question. Um, apparently we have someone who is clearly here and clearly looking very closely. And some of the prints, it appears as though that it was brushed on, not inked on with right. rare. Yeah, that's so right, they're, they're brushed on. Are, are all of them brushed on, would you know? Or uh, no, I think she probably, used, she probably used a roller on some of them. But in so many of the prints, you can see the brush strokes. I mean, that's what, what makes each one distinctive. So I think she did that more times than not. I mean, she could have used the roller. I mean, artists did that. I, I, I assume she probably used that a little bit. So we're just a, at an hour. There are no more questions from our Zoom audience and I don't see hands raised in the room. Um, there is a chorus of thank you, thank you, thank you from your Zoom audience. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, thank uh, you, thank Roger. you for watching. So thank you for being, you know, our leader. Uh, this evening, this seemed to work uh, really w very well. And so we're pleased that in traveling all the way from California, we still found an audience to learn yeah. from you about Francis Gearhart. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Yeah, and it's yeah. interesting because this Zoom thing has become quite a, a substitute for reality. I don't know. Everything's changing. Thank you.